Welcome to Passion Time. I'm here with Joan Iflin. She's an academic. Uh, she's been so since 2004, but way before that she was already working on this issue of food addiction. And now she's been hired to write the textbook on food addiction. So we have the expert. She's right here with us. But first, before we start, because this is Passion Time, I want to ask you why or how did you know that you were living your passion? Well, because I was helping people. Food addiction is easy to, to address if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, if you have the wrong information or somebody's telling you that you can leave addictive foods in your food plan, it's impossible. Right. So I just tell people what I know from the research and it seems to help them. So I couldn't do anything else. I have to do this. And you know, and you, and you started this a long time ago. Uh, when I met you, you were doing something else. You had an MBA from Stanford. But you have done so much research, and now there are new findings. So share with the new findings with me. Well, they are disturbing, Patty, uh, particularly around children. We're finding that these addictive anomalies, if you will, or brain dysfunction are occurring in children as young as two. Oh my Lord. And that is scary. So we see research like a study of nine-year-old Mexican children. Uh -huh. The obese children have less brain mass. So this is now serious. Uh, this is not a cosmetic issue of how, how much fat tissue you have on your body. This is brain damage very similar to recreational drugs. Happily, it's reversible. That's a good yes. thing to know because uh, I'd like to know how food addiction develops. We know that when you take a drug, and how, how that gets worse over time, but how does food addiction develop? You're talking about a two-year-old. Well, it's, it's through exposure. So they're exposed to television commercials. They're exposed to the ingredients themselves, the sugars, the flours, the dairy, the processed fats, excessive salt, gluten has a high level of a gluteomorphine in it. Wow. And caffeine. Children are being given caffeinated drinks and chocolate. So uh, it's through that repeat exposure the brain becomes sensitized to these substances. Now you, you're an entrepreneur, you own Victory Meals, which is unprocessed foods. Yes. Tell me how, because we always hear, oh no, it's too expensive to eat unprocessed foods, that's why people eat processed foods. What's the real story behind that? Oh my goodness, it's so cheap. I mean, it's so inexpensive to eat unprocessed. You think about the cost of a bag, a big bag of carrots, it's a couple of dollars. That right. could be your vegetable for almost right. the whole week. Right. Um, the things that are eaten in, in unprocessed food plants are sweet potatoes, and they're rice, and they're beans. And those are the least expensive foods you can get. Right. And it's very easy to make them. You know, you just set them in the oven, or you boil them in a pot, and you make a, a couple of days' worth at a time. So easy, simple, beautiful, delicious. It's the best kept secret in the food industry. Right, right. Yeah. And they want you keep from knowing that. Yeah. Um, do you think people are afraid of being labeled food addicts? You know, that's so interesting. There are two studies out of Australia in the okay. last few years about uh, the acceptance of that label. And obese people were asked if they would rather be called a food addict. And they said yes. And they said it was because they felt there was less blame. Okay. So they, they would, people blame people for being right. obese, but people know that an addiction is acquired from the environment, from television and from availability and cheap pricing. So these people were actually happier with the food addiction label. Well, what happens... What, what is the real story behind our food supply? Because we have the pyramid, the USDA pyramid and all that. But what is really wrong with our food supply today? It is full of ingredients that make us crazy, sick, <laughs> fat. So we now see the brain damage. The, the very, very sensitive reaction to even reminders. You know, even if the food is not there, you can think about a grocery store or you can just think about some place where you've been, where you've had a processed food, and it will trigger those cravings. And it's widespread. It's dopamine and serotonin and endorphin and endocannabinoids and opiate pathways. So it's a very widespread response because there are so many different ingredients. Okay. Sugar does one thing. Flour does something else. The processed fats do something. The salt does something. So... If you look at the broad spectrum of these 
ingredients, these substances, then you can see why there would be a broad reaction in all those craving pathways. But then now we see on the other side that thinking, learning, memory, decision-making, restraint are all not working during a craving. Uh -huh. So you, you get the cravings to stop by uh, retraining the brain. So you eat, but you don't have a processed ingredient in your meal. You, you eat broccoli, and right. that will not trigger the response. And you just keep doing that until you, start you retrain the brain. It. You, yeah. you incorporate new things that, that are mm -hmm. healthy for you. Yeah. Now, why is this so hard to treat? Now, we know addiction to drugs is hard to treat. Yes. Why is food addiction particularly hard to treat? Well, first of all, it starts at a young age. Right. It can start in utero and just never stop. So you don't have one moment of knowing what it might feel like not to have uh, processed foods in your system and food additives. So that's one reason relative to drugs that it's harder to treat. Two, it's everywhere. Three, it's legal and cheap. Yeah. Four, it's deeply embedded in our social rituals. Yeah, right. And um, five, it's always sold in these combinations. So we know if somebody is doing alcohol and cigarettes and marijuana and cocaine, uh, that they are going to be harder to treat. That's something called polysubstance abuse. Okay. And that is the exact nature of processed food abuse. People are not eating sugar. They're eating a combination of sugar and flour and salt and processed so it's fat not just and one dairy thing, right? and gluten and caffeine. That's how uh, fast food meals are sold in combinations of all seven of the major addictive categories. Now, not everybody becomes a food addict. Right. So right. some people can eat some sweets and can eat some processed foods and yet not be addicted. Right. So is the same, the same chemistry that happens with addiction to drugs the same thing that happens with people who become addicted to food? Yes, yes. It is... Uh, amazingly identical. Okay. Food addiction is also a little bit worse because you have the involvement of the gut. So okay. you have bacteria growing in the gut that actually release uh, enzymes, peptides that attach to the brain and make the whole situation so much worse. Mm, okay. And you don't have that so much in drug addiction. You have you have the involvement of the endocrine system and on and on. It affects on. everything. The whole body. Right. Well, you're not nourishing cells, so you have cell basic cell dysfunction. Yeah, it's very bad. Is Patty. that why it's so hard to lose weight? Yes, absolutely. If you can just, I mean, you know, I have a new motto. Which is, <laughs> if it has a label on it, don't buy it. Okay. So okay. if it's been inside a manufacturing facility, the FDA, I, I would say, in my opinion, the FDA has really lost control yes, of, of, of monitoring the food supply. Mm -hmm. Mostly food industry executives are in the FDA now. So um, if it's been inside a manufacturing facility, given that the food industry knows so much about creating addiction, you have to wonder if they've put something in it that will make you overeat it. Because they can. Right. Yeah. Now, you have a Facebook page that anybody can join yes. to get help. Tell me yes. about that. Food Addiction Education. I am so excited about this. We have people in recovery now actually moving out of the disease all over the world. Alabama, Arkansas, Australia, Argentina, all over the world. Is it a support group? It is. It's, it's designed to be an education group. There are five or six other um, properly licensed therapists. I'm not really a therapist. I'm more of a researcher, but we do have real therapists and uh, counselors on there. And we are just watching for people to ask questions. But I also, I post discussion questions and research that I'm looking at. So it's like an open classroom. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much, Joan Ifland, yeah. uh, for joining us. And Thank you. Now you know what you can do about food addiction. So join the group.